Misconception number 11. The Wii was the first example of motion control. Actually, motion control as a concept is pretty old. The only thing the Wii did differently with motion control is that it did it well. Back in the days of the NES, there were all sorts of peripherals that seem awfully familiar now, such as the power glove, which you wore on your hand and controlled games via gestures, kind of like the Wii, and the U-Force, which generated a field in which hand motions would be recognized as game input without having to actually touch anything, sort of like the Kinect. The difference was that these peripherals didn't work so well, and they were made to alter the experience of existing games rather than play games specifically for them. Motion control continued to be experimented with throughout game history, such as the tilt sensors in some Game Boy Advance games, and the controller-free eye toy for the PlayStation 2. Misconception number 12. If a video game is classified as AAA, this means it is good. AAA is actually not a measurement of quality, high sales, or good reviews, but in fact just means that the game is big budget. Of course, it'd be great to live in a world where the more time and money is spent on a game, the better it is. But this just isn't the case, as there are AAA titles that are crappy and low budget titles that Misconception number 13. All PlayStation 2 games are on DVD. Remember, just because a game console has the ability to read a disc does not mean that every disc made for that system is that one. Believe it or not, many PlayStation 2 games are actually CDs, not DVDs. Although the console was also a DVD player, DVDs are generally speaking more expensive than CDs, and DVDs were only used for games in which the storage capacity was needed. You can tell if a PlayStation 2 game is a CD or a DVD quite easily. The games that have blue surfaces are CDs. Misconception number 14. Games with a circular scratch on the disc surface are ruined and must be replaced. Circle scratches usually happen when a game console is shifted or tilted while the disc is spinning, and the laser mechanism touches the disc, scratching the surface in a circle, making it unreadable. Although this makes the game unplayable, it is possible to fix the game using a disc resurfacer, which will actually strip off the upper layers of a disc. It doesn't always work, but many stores offer the service at a very low price, and usually guarantee it will work or your money back. Scratches and scuffs can make a game difficult to read, but not impossible, and they can usually be fixed in this manner. However, if a game is scratched so badly that the light shines through it, then congratulations on your brand new coaster. Misconception number 15. A blinking light on the NES indicates the game is dirty and needs to be cleaned. I've already covered this topic previously, but it's always worth talking about. Everybody hates getting that blinking light, but this is in fact not related to a game being dirty, but actually related to the 10 NES lockout chip. The connectors on a game have 72 pins. Four of these pins connect to the 10 NES chip, which is there to make sure that the game is officially licensed by Nintendo. If the connection is not secure, the NES will prevent you from playing a game that it deems unlicensed by constantly resetting. While a poor connection can, in theory, be due to dirt, it is more often than not due to the pins being bent from the unusual front-loading design of the NES, made to resemble a VCR. Top-loading consoles don't have this issue. Blowing on the cartridge is harmful, and cleaning them should only be done if dirt is visible on the connectors. And then, you should be sure not to use any water-based solutions as they cause the copper to corrode. But remember, the flashing lights is usually caused by bent pins. In other words, the problem is with the system, not with the game. The easiest fix is to replace the front-loading system with a top-loading one, though if you're daring, you could remove or disable the 10 NES chip yourself. Misconception number 16, the Game Boy was the first handheld system. Of course, there were handheld systems before the Game Boy, but the Game Boy is usually touted as the first handheld game console, meaning something that you put games into to play, not handheld games on their own like those little Tiger Electronic dealies. Those were popular as a kid, 
and the first time I ever heard of a Game Boy, it was via a commercial that touted changeable games as the main selling point. I was amazed at the time. However, the first handheld console was actually the Microvision by Milton Bradley, in which the entire front of the thing was the snap-away cartridge, which could be exchanged for another. There were only 12 games released for it, and it wasn't exactly popular, but it was the first. Misconception number 17. Console makers have always embraced third-party games. It seems to me today that a game console's success is made or broken by third-party support. But there was a time when third-party games were not so well received by console makers. The first third-party developer was Activision, made up out of ex-Atari employees who left due to poor treatment by the company and formed their own gaming company. However, instead of making their own console, as many expected, they made games for Atari's console. Up until then, all Atari games were developed by Atari, including ones that were ports of arcade games made by other companies. Atari was so incensed that they sued Activision, claiming it was illegal for them to release products for their console, and even spread a false rumor that their cartridges might damage your system. Atari lost their lawsuit and gaming was changed forever. Misconception number 18. Blood and violence is a relatively new concept to gaming. A lot of people think that including blood and gore in games started in the 90s, with Mortal Kombat usually being the first game people mention. But even back in the Atari days, there were bits of blood in games like Halloween or Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, you might say bits of blood don't equate to a game that has tons of blood and gore. Well, the first very bloody game was an arcade game called Chiller, which came out in 1986. It was a light gun game with a horror theme, which included shooting at prisoners chained to walls and torture devices, and even included spurts of blood and flesh tearing off. Believe it or not, Chiller was also released for the NES, though the most violent aspects of it were removed. Misconception number 19. Adventure for Atari was the first console RPG. Adventure is one of the most common games cited as being the first console RPG, but in fact, is it really even an RPG at all? It's based off of an RPG, a PC game by the same name. Now this was back in the days before PC games had graphics. It was a text adventure. Adventure for an Atari is an attempt to translate it into gameplay without any of the plot. Ostensibly, it's a maze game where the object is to find objects and return them to the starting point. The first RPG for consoles was an Atari game, however, called Dragon Stomper, which includes RPG tropes such as random battles, stat increases, and quests. Misconception number 20 Rockman, the Japanese name for Mega Man, is named after... Rocks. Well, it is pretty weird to think he'd be named after Rocks, as in stones, but the truth is stranger. It's actually a reference to rock music. Along with his sister, Roll, you have Rock and Roll, while the Japanese name for Proto Man was Blues. Other Mega Man musical names include Bass, which is Forte in Japan, Ballad, Beat, and Rush. Misconception number 21. 